Hi, folks. Hi, great to see you. So great to see you, too. Happy solstice, everyone. Oh, happy solstice. Yeah. So, Dr. G, we have today with us Nikki Smith, um, who's a mountaineer and has some questions, and Drew Halsey. And I'm not sure who else will be joining us, but um, I'd like to talk about body inclusivity in sports. And um, I'd also like to um, talk a little bit about <laughs> summertime <laughs> because I put my bathing suit on yesterday for the first time um, this year. And it's always like this kind of come to Jesus moment for me where I feel extremely self-conscious and I don't want anybody to see my butt. And um, you know, I'm 45 years old and I kind of, am like over, like, I want to get over this <laughs> <laughs> and there's like nothing wrong with my body. Right. So why do I feel this? Um, like I'm not good enough and I'm not beautiful enough. And I, if I want to be beautiful, I have to be thin. It's sort of this whole like old school mentality about hotness and thinness. So I know I'm not the only person who's putting on their bathing suit right now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that's just somewhere that I thought we could start. I love that. Whom do you want to start first? I want to make sure that everybody has a voice. Um, whoever wants to go first. <laughs> okay, well, I can, I can start talking about some of those things and then I just look forward to everybody else's inputs and, and thoughts, of course. You know, I think starting with the second piece, uh, first, that sort of summertime instinct. This isn't a Caroline problem that Caroline has to fix herself and get over. It's not an individual problem. This is a society problem. This is our, and I would use more colorful language if I didn't think this was going to be a broader audience, a very messed up situation in which everybody is made to feel inadequate because inadequate bodies buy things to improve their adequacy. And it's not just adequacy in terms of how an individual looks in the mirror and experiences themselves. It's adequacy that comes to the very root of body size privilege in this country, where at end of, end of privilege in general, where the bodies that get not only more goodies, but safety, and progression in life, in sport, in, in professions are the lighter skinned, younger, thinner, cisser, hetero or abler bodies. And so understanding this, everyone sort of leans towards how do I fit myself into this absurdly narrow totally arbitrarily defined mold in order to be safer. We all seek safety and, and we all come from different backgrounds where safety may mean, you know, hey, I'd like to be more accepted or like safety for people who have any trauma in their background. So, so these compulsions make sense. And if we understand what's pushing on us, we can be more compassionate with our own response to that. In the final analysis, I like to tell patients, you don't have to love your body because loving your body is nice, but it's also sort of a, a false trope brought about by people who want to sell us things so that we love our bodies. And you don't even have to accept your body because body acceptance can be very complicated too. I'm struck by the patients who deal with chronic pain every day, who deal with hard to measure medical diagnoses that impact their function every day. And it can be really hard to love a body that gives you pain and challenge the daily. What we can all do though, is be caretakers of our bodies. We can commit to saying, as far as we know, this is all I'm gonna get. So to the best of my knowledge, to the best of the ways that I'm resourced today, I'm gonna be gentle, compassionate, I will rest, I will move for joy, I will nourish. And I will try to find a way of distracting myself from the negative feelings when I put on that bathing suit. 
And if possible, I'm gonna find the positives too. But I'm gonna try to distract and I'm gonna say, this body isn't getting in a bathing suit in order to be on some magazine cover because even the people who are on the magazine cover are getting airbrushed and retouched. This is a body that's getting in a bathing suit so I can go sup. This is a body getting into a bathing suit so that I can put on my sunscreen and get out in the sun and feel the warmth of my body and glory in the nature that surrounds me. That's why I'm putting on a bathing suit and F anybody else. Yeah, I love that. It's, it's a constant, um, it's an interesting challenge because it feels so risky. I actually bought like a thong bathing suit because I was like, I got to get over this insecurity. And yesterday I was like, F it. I'm just going to wear my thong in front of everybody and I don't care. Yeah. Um, but it's still like that moment of like, oh, I'm doing something kind of wrong. Yeah. Well, for women especially, but people of all genders, this is true. To emerge in the world without apology for yourself is to risk being thought too much by the rest of the world. For a woman to walk confidently into any situation without that sort of undertone of like, apologize for yourself, speak before anyone else can, can look it or speak it, that you know the ways in which you're not quite enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are all socialized to feel that way because strong, powerful, confident women are dangerous. We get shit done. So, so to be able to, to walk in and, and neither to be like, I'm the best in the world or I'm the worst, I'm terrible, I feel so terrible about myself, but just to walk in, in your skin and be and enjoy actually provides a little ray of light around you that cuts back and pushes back the pollution of everyone else's difficulties with their own bodies. It gives space, it gives permission for them not to be perfect either. Because you're all just hanging out as a human on the planet. And it is vulnerable, but it's also okay to give yourself permission to be. Who do you wanna? I I, I know I don't I don't wanna. Oh yeah, um, I'll add to that. I was I've always been the fat kid at the pool, so um, you know that's kind of a, a stigma of wearing a shirt at the pool. Um, that was always a big deal kind of growing up, and I never, for myself, I never uh, subscribed to that. I never was like I'm gonna hide what I got because I don't know. Even early on, as like a third grader, being the fat kid at the pool like I wanted to feel like everybody else so I didn't throw that like that uh stereotype on myself of like the fat kid at the pool with the shirt on it's on in the pool because I wanted to feel comfortable and be like my friend so um I've always encouraged everybody else to do it you know um I feel like I, I see those I mean I see like other out of the pool like they're, they're hiding their potential of just being themselves when they like throw that shirt on or um i just want everybody to be themselves you know feel comfortable and i know it takes a lot of steps to get there but weirdly i just never like would subscribe to that for myself was like that like hiding what i got like i've been looking for shorter shorts and like everything else too this summer and like i bought a pair of i got a pair of like really short running shorts that like I put it on. I was like, heck yeah, this feels like pretty amazing to show off just more of myself because like who cares, you know, um, a lot of it, a lot of it is just our own personal like stuff that's how, how, holding us back. I wouldn't or what you said earlier, like what we see in advertisements and stuff. And it gives us those those thoughts of maybe I'm not couldn't live up to that. Uh, what I want my body to look like or whatever. But really, I just for myself, I just I want to be comfortable with who I am. And so I just kind of go for it. And, you know. And Drew, you're kind of I feel like you have come onto the scene as sort of um, like that's what you're about is trying to. Um, you're like taking a, a straight on look at some of these things that we, we these 
preconceived notions that we all have, I think, mm -hmm. um, and talking about how it's, it's like it, beauty and achievement don't have to do with body size. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one of the reasons why I wanted you to be on the call because yeah, I well, really you. love your posts about that. And I, yeah, I, did, I learned a lot. I didn't really think of myself as this like, like a, I mean, spokesperson for this kind of stuff. I just always had these thoughts and like, um, and then I found the outlet of climbing and um, I kind of combined the two and, you know, I started climbing because I didn't see anybody that looked like me climbing um i had to google like why do like can ropes hold me or like can can i actually do this thing and i kind of me and my wife kind of experimented and went to the gym and we're like yeah we can do this thing so that's why i started posting myself um two years later it's turned into you know i get to show others like that they can do it too and that's been my whole mission of, of my climbing um so yeah that's cool so yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Nikki, mm -hmm. do you have a question? What do you think um, about this? I have a lot of thoughts on this. In some ways, I, I've struggled my entire life to feel comfortable in my body. Um, a lot of trans people have. Um, but even once I be, was able to, to fully more accept who I was and outwardly show who I was. Uh, it's a real struggle, uh, you know, after 40 years of being told you can't move a certain way, you can't dress a certain way, you can't act a certain way, trying to feel comfortable within that is really difficult. But then there's also this thing where, you know, for a trans woman, society expects us to portray femininity, you know, completely. If if we're not fully made up, if we're not fully, um, it's a horrible term, but passable, then we get attacked, we get misgendered. But at the same time, in doing that, we also get attacked for portraying the stereotypical male version of what a woman should be. There's all these things that no matter what we do, we lose in this. And I think the other thing that is difficult with this conversation in many ways is, like you mentioned, wearing a thong. On many beaches, you know, you can have a place where a lot of white women will be out on the beach wearing a thong and a black woman will show up in a thong and immediately someone gets upset at them and says they're being indecent, a trans woman, the same thing police can get involved and it can become very dangerous. For a trans woman in many states, if I get arrested like for wearing a thong, which could be under indecent exposure, I'm likely to get fully arrested and put on a sex offender registry list. I have the same issue in using a public bathroom in many places. On top of that, in many states, if I got arrested for indecent exposure, while they're judging my body as female, they would still put me in the men's side of the prison or jail. So there's a lot of risk in, in trying to feel comfortable with myself and revealing too much because it can cause real danger for a lot of us. And so I think trying to find that balance of accepting myself, of doing things that feel good to me while still knowing that I'm in real danger of being attacked, of being arrested, uh, are really out there. And there's a lot of people, not just in the trans community, a lot of folks of color that face these same issues. And I think that side of the discussion is often left out that society still places limits on there, even outside of the stereotypical beauty the beauty issues that, that we're all trying to change. Nikki, what amazing points you've made. I honor you profoundly. And your words remind me of a brilliant book that is one of my favorites called Fearing the Black Body uh, by Dr. String. And 
it, it was so eye-opening for me, even as I try to consider myself aware of this world and aware of intersectionality, all of the things that I didn't know. And it is really important to say without in any way diminishing Caroline's experience of fear and risk when she enters the world, that that fear and risk comes from a highly gendered, highly socialized place in which even a woman who occupies all the positions of privilege has been made to feel that her body is inadequate and wrong. But when we, when we contrast that to your actual lack of safety, to the true physical existential threat to your body in the world and to that of people of color, to that of people who are fat potentially as well, it's a very important leveling moment to take a breath and be like, okay, let me just, let me just frame this where it, where it should be. Yeah, and that also doesn't diminish though, as you mentioned, what Caroline's going through or what any other cis um, white person might be going through. I mean, it, it is real. Society expects a lot from us, pushes a lot on us, but there also is added risk and issues for for people from historically marginalized communities. Yeah. I love Sonia Renee Taylor's perspective, uh, who is a brilliant activist and author um, who you know, points out that our act of rebellion as, for instance, in my case, a woman who occupies all the positions of, of privilege, our act of rebellion is to say, absolutely not. I'm not going to buy into feeling shitty about myself. I'm not going to do things to hide, to cover who I am. Because if I resist the very institution that made those things necessary, there are ways in which I begin very slightly changing the system so that Nikki is more safe, so that she can decide to go without makeup if she wants to. And that's a more safe presentation because we're not holding up standards of oppression that mean that only certain people get safety. I mean, it's certainly, you know, my <laughs> feeling okay about like my butt or whatever has nothing, you know, it's, it doesn't compare to, to actually being unsafe, like you're talking about Nikki. And it is, um, it's, it's good for me to hear that because, um, you know, sometimes I'm just in my own world. And that's pretty eye-opening to think about how many people might feel physically unsafe by simply expressing themselves in the way that I get to all the time. Yeah, seems really unfair. <laughs> and like you said, Dr. G, it's like, you know, yeah, what do we, what, what do we do? How do we, how do we, how do we change for, for the better? How do we evolve, you know, into a society um, and people who are more accepting? I mean, it seems to me that dismantling these systems that keep people in all varieties of bodies oppressed are, are the only ways we can, we can do it. Again, we can't fix ourselves so that we're just good enough for whatever the situation calls for, whether it's the judge in our judge, not refereed sport, whether it's the coach who's trying to decide, whether it's the dance teacher who's trying to figure out who gets to be in the front row, um, whether it's the person who decides whether or not the police are gonna be called in a certain situation. Um, but all of us can, can resist in ways that Drew resists by saying, I'm gonna be a fat climber and I'm going to resist a stereotype, a visible stereotype that people say, no, that's that, you know, people don't do that as much. Um, we have to, we have to actively resist those things. And I think those of us who are at least risk of danger have to be out in front, covering our sisters behind us, Co you know, not, not trying to step in front of, but to, to take the first round of, of, criticism or of challenge, because if I step out and speak out loudly against something, the odds are given my body privilege and the various other, other privileges that I hold, I'm not gonna get harmed. 
I'm not going to get in trouble. Uh, you know, no, no ill will come to me. So it's, it's on me to say, I'm going to step out. How can I step out in front? And then, and then provide some, some momentum so that those who don't have it have less of a hard time. What is that? Does that feel right, Nikki? Is that something that matters? I think it definitely is important. I also think along with stepping out in front is supporting folks from those underrepresented communities. You know, when when Drew is out there and he posts this amazing photo of, or video of him bouldering shirtless, you know, supporting that, showing that, that there's nothing wrong with that. That is normal. That is That is for everyone. And not enough people have been doing that. That's only recently that this is starting to become a thing where people are starting to see themselves in, in their sports or activities or even daily life. And so having, having the ability to step out yourself and challenge these, but then also supporting those who are fighting to just be themselves, period, can be huge. And a lot of times, I go out with friends and something happens and they stay silent. And it makes it really hard to want to be out there. I'm sure Drew's faced issues where he's been out climbing and someone has said something and no one stands up. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I always think of like, I go first so someone else can go second. That's kind of my mentality, like my mentality with what, I, what I'm trying to accomplish in my climbing journey or whatever you want to call it um so like i want to be on the forefront of something so the second person to do it will be more comfortable or like and it's just start something like a wave of like it's okay to be ourselves <laughs> it's it's weird to say that but like we're just not noticed especially in the outdoor industry like fat people aren't seen so i, I that's why i'm like trying to <laughs> that's why I, I, I do what i do is just so that starts something where people can start feeling more comfortable in the our outdoor spaces or whatnot can be filled with more people who feel great about themselves, you know? I love that. I think that's incredibly vital. One of the things that our clinic thinks about is not just being body positive in, for instance, our social media posts, but explicitly being fat positive because it's not enough to be neutral on these topics. You have to stake a position. You have to actually say and post and do and show what matters goodness knows we know that representation matters and mm -hmm. there is a a really ugly double standard when it comes particularly to fat bodies in which all the medical professionals uh, you know narrowly and and stupidly and unscientifically just keep hammering people eat less move more this doesn't work that's, that's not, that's, that's not the solution and fat bodies don't need a solution. They're not a problem. And yet in the same breath, society says that photographs or images of fat people in nature doing things is somehow unappealing or is mm -hmm. inappropriate or promotes fatness. I say this with just incredible air quotes around it because of course, none of those things are real and right, but you sort of can't win. And so I really appreciate the folks who are out there showing that any variety of bodies can do anything. Yeah, it's like they tell us to like tell like us to get off the couch, but like when we do, they tell us it's not really safe for us to do the things that everyone else is doing. <laughs> I could countless times I've gotten be like, yeah, you're gonna like pull your hands or you're gonna like break it or pull a tendon and you gotta do all thing when and I have to tell them like I'm two years into this and like I'm okay. It takes a lot of work to get where I got, but you know, I don't <laughs> I've only been injured once and that was because I'd sprained my ankle at a boulder field. Like I wasn't even climbing. <laughs> so it's like they tell us to to go move, but when we do they're like, whoa, why are you here? <laughs> Yeah. There's even more issues with the industry on top of that, where we're told to go out and recreate and be active, yet the outdoor industry and fitness industries don't make clothing that fits everyone. <laughs>
<laughs> no, yeah. I had to wear Walmart clothes for my first like year, and then I got to being like, I want the, the gear everybody else has, but oh, I found like three things. So that's slowly changing. Though. I've had good conversations with the industry and some industry folks about that. So. Yeah, this is, um, I think the clothing thing is really interesting and I was really um, glad to see your post about it the other day and thanks for bringing that up, Nikki. Oh, no problem, yeah. Yeah. Um, Nikki, could I hear more about the clothing issue? Because I would really love to hear your expertise on this. Um, yeah, I'm sure Drew has has <laughs> a lot that, that he could say in there, but I'm 6'3 and I'm... I'm pretty muscular, I guess, overall. And it is very difficult to find clothing even at my size. And most people would look at a photo of me and think from the photo that I'm like the perfect average female body, yet I can't find pants that are ever long enough. Um, for a lot of technical clothing, there's just this assumption that women don't ice climb enough to need these technical items or participate in you know high-end skiing or whatever it might be to where you know for the men's side there's four different versions or options of technical jackets and for the women there's one and it's not doesn't have all the features that the men's version has um, i still have to buy a lot of men's clothing just um, just to ice climb and that necessarily isn't even because of my size. That's just because it's not made. Uh, footwear is the another issue where um, there aren't larger sizes for women or smaller sizes. So women with really petite, small feet can't often get ice boots. Uh, if they can, it's usually from um, a, a child's version of an ice boot, which is non-technical. And so some leading ice climbing climbers that are women are using non-technical kids boots. Um, it can be really difficult to get high performance climbing shoes for folks with larger feet, whether it's male or female, because they often end at size 12 or size 45 and the only larger sizes are in beginner shoes. So there's still a lot of issues, whether it's body size, whether it's shape, gender, that really limit someone's progression in the outdoors because of that. Well, and I think even more than limiting the experience of your body in nature and having the right gear is that erases you. It erases really? you, Nikki, as a trans woman in who has a right to experience the nature in the way she chooses. It, it erases you, Drew, in your right to go climb and have great gear, stuff that really fits well. Mm -hmm. The reason that gear continues to improve is that they're always constantly say, you know, doing research and figuring out what works best. But they say, no, 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 not, not for you though. And, mm -hmm. and that erasure is unacceptable. Yeah. One of the other issues that we have with the outdoor industry is the majority of outdoor clothing, outdoor gear is all designed for the average male. So ice climbing axes, the handles are first and foremost designed for the average male's hand. So when a woman gets an ice axe and they're having a wider grip, they're going to get pumped out more quickly. Wow. Uh, the weight and balance and length of the axe is designed to kind of match a male's swing rather than female swing, which can be shorter because of height differences. Um, you know, there's a lot of things in there and so much of our gear is designed that way. And then they just take that version, maybe shrink it a little bit or make a little slight change and say it's a women's version. But it wasn't actually designed in the first place for a woman. Yeah. And this mm -hmm. always comes back to body image as well. Because when you get the message from society at large, from the representation you see, and then from the gear itself, that your body doesn't have a place here. Of course that impacts our sense of self. Of course it does. And I think it, it continues to be so important to recognize the many, many, many arrows that come at us with regards to body image. 
and again, continue to take it out of being sort of, oh, I just need to get better at loving my body or appreciating it or whatever, and just be like, oh, the odds are against me. And, and then working from there and then working from a place of whether you want to call it righteous anger or of resistance is to continue to, to make your voice known, to continue to hold those companies accountable and to continue to say, I belong, show up and, and give me more reasons to remember why I in fact am phenomenal and why I absolutely belong in this space, exactly how I want to present myself. Well, it seems like the climbing companies have some work to do. Outdoor companies, I should say. Outdoor fitness, pretty much every company out there still has a long way to go. I haven't yeah. really thought about that, Nikki, because that means that this whole, like, you know, the women are, like, working, it sort of solidifies the gap in, in performance and achievement between male men and women. Definitely. And plenty of people have been able to to make it work and adapt and overcome you know that's what we do as humans but it still sends a message overall when when you can't get what you need when you constantly have to modify your gear or have someone else you spend a lot of money to get a backpack and until recently had to maybe take it somewhere else to have someone sew on additional straps to make it so you could clip the waist belt um, you know, chalk bags often, mm. even the waist belt on that isn't large enough for a lot of people. You know, there's constant things that you have to do that can add additional cost to it. Tailoring your clothing, um, which I know a lot of women in, especially in ice climbing in the outdoors have to do in order to have their stuff fit. You know, that's an additional cost that not everyone can afford. There's already so many barriers in participating in these sports. And when a lot of people are forced to pay more just to participate, it adds another layer in there. Mm -hmm. My question for you, Nikki, is um, when you were talking about certain moments with friends where they um, you were going out and uh, something happened and people didn't speak up, um, I'm wondering what, how can people speak up in the right way, in the best way? I think it varies situation to situation. And I think one of the best ways to start is to talk to whoever you're hanging out with and ask them how they would like you to respond. In certain situations, I think someone speaking out could actually make things more dangerous for all of us, but especially for me. But in general, you know, I've had friends where they feel like, well, the person who said whatever they said to you me speaking up wouldn't have changed anything. And that's not always the point. It says something to me, regardless of whether it's gonna change that person's perspective, it says something to me that you're there for me, that you're gonna stand up for me and stand beside me when something happens. And that can be just as important as, as standing up to the other person and what that might do to them for them. You know, sometimes someone is just ignorant about the situation or, or just not fully thinking it through and says something careless and someone speaking up, you know, that they might apologize, they might learn something. Other times that person doesn't care, but it's not always about them. Uh, one of the issues, at least with queer identity, is you never know who's queer. So for 40 years of my life, I sat and listened to friends and family and um, climbing partners, coworkers, say horrible things about the LGBTQIA2S plus community, about trans people, whatever it might be, not knowing that that was me. And that really contributed to me feeling like I would never be accepted or never belong in the outdoors. And that can be deadly for a lot of people the rate of suicide among the LGBTQI2S plus population is up to 40% versus I think it's around six to 9% of, of the rest of the population with suicidal ideation. You know, it's really bad. And that's not because there's anything wrong with this. It's because of how we're treated in society, the things that we constantly hear, the messaging that's always coming at us. 
And so having someone say something could have been huge. If one friend would have told that person that what they were saying was wrong, I at least would have felt I had someone who I might be able to trust in or confide in. And I was so afraid when I started to come out, even to my closest friends, because I had never heard them speak up in any way. And just, I think there's so many things people can do, but just starting there with, with just when you see something that someone is doing to marginalize someone, to hurt someone, just speaking out is huge. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I think you are an incredible, incredible woman. And I am so sorry just that you experienced that kind of stigma and that kind of lack of support for so long. And it makes your emergence all the more miraculous and beautiful. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I've heard a lot of, um, you know, I started climbing maybe 20 something years ago and I heard a lot of homophobic remarks from people. And, um, there was probably times, you know, where, where I didn't speak up and I should have, um, that's something that, um, always rubbed me the wrong way because I was like, it's not okay to talk about people like that. And I wonder what it is that makes people not speak up. You know? Some of it, some of it gets so ingrained into, into our language, into just society. Um, I'm sure Drew has examples of this with, with issues with being, being larger. But you know, you hear terms we've heard forever in climbing foot faggotry. You know, <laughs> with with technique. Um, in England, they'd call a drop knee the gay knee. Um, there's climbs, you know, there's the gay science, there's limp-wristed faggot, you know, there's all these horrible root names. When someone mm -hmm. did something that you didn't like, you would say, that's so gay. Mm -hmm. The comp boots for ice climbing where you have a crampon bolted onto the bottom of it were called fruit boots because that's gay. That was considered lame which lame is also another term that we use all the time, which is ableist. You know, there's so much of this in our lexicon that often we're not even aware of, but continues to marginalize people. And so really thinking about it, you know, people often like constantly everyone's policing my language and I have to change to be PC, but look at what the roots and origins of a lot of the language that we use and it's, derogatory towards an entire group of people. And we don't think about that at all in there and just continue mm. to do it, even for people who are actively trying to support their queer friends or their fat friends or their friends in the adaptive community or, or someone from communities of color. Like we still use language without even realizing it that further marginalizes and hurts them. Yeah, one of the things that I continue to see regularly in you know, my, my scope of practice as an eating disorder physician is that even in circles that would never dream of using a slur that would denigrate a person of color, a person from the LGBTQIA community, they are perfectly comfortable fat shaming someone, a politician they don't like, or, you know, um, almost anybody. It's, it's the last thing that even in bastions of, of so-called sort of awareness is, is like a free for all. And that needs to continue to change, you know? And I, I completely agree with you, Nikki. We're not talking about sort of PC police. We're talking about not using in our language words that make it impossible for someone else to live safely in their body. Um, and, and, and fatness continues to be sort of that last place where folks just feel they can jump right in and, and fat shame and it's just not okay. 
Yeah, kind of speaking on the outdoor stuff, I was talking about um, the outdoor industry in one of my posts, and a lot of the, I had about six or seven comments saying, like, you should probably lose weight just so you could fit in those clothes. You know, for some reason, like, weight is a fair game kind of shaming topic because um, I feel like I could totally change my body by just eating less or whatever is, I guess, their ideas of whatever they have. <laughs> um, but they don't take an account of how hard it is for a lot of people to deal with food shame and like disordered eating and um, just saying lose weight to fit in those clothes like I shouldn't have to just because this is my body type like I look around in my family and we're all short squat five six like men in my family and we're all pretty like barrel chested dudes like I don't know this is how we were made. I don't know, just an X. And even if we do lose weight, we still kind of look the same kind of body type. Like we're still short, stocky people. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it's that is very fair game. And I think about high school, and I never was bullied like severely, but like because I had like a bigger chest, like I would get people that would grab like my man boob or guess what, whatever you would call it, just because they were out there. They just grab and run off and like it was a sort of a little bit of bullying, but I kind of flipped it on it where I grabbed whatever they had and just like squeezed too, just cause I like fought back in that way. I know it's probably not the best way, but I was just angry of like being bullied. So I, it like, I guess violence begat violence or something. It's just like, you just get fed up with it. Um, and this is all before social media and stuff. And now we have people that get to just say whatever they want to just cause they think they can. Um, I don't know. I remember it, like, this is tough. Like, we, for some reason, it, I mean, I think, I mean, growing up, I was kind of the fat, funny kid. I kind of, like, that's uh, the role I, uh, like, took on upon myself. But, like, I don't know. I guess they think we can take a joke, but some, a lot of people can't. And they, they, it hurts sometimes. One of the major remaining problems out of many is that fatness is still considered a disease. It's still considered a situation to be solved or fixed. Mm -hmm. And when I was, I was speaking with somebody who was doing a piece about being a fat woman who is an avid hiker and who represents herself out in nature and, and how much negative press she's gotten among it that, you know, you shouldn't be, I think the idea was you, you shouldn't be showing your body in nature um, because it, it celebrates something that's, that's diseased. And one of the things that I thought in the moment was if someone with cancer goes out and takes a hike, no one says you're celebrating the disease of cancer. You know, I mean, this country, this world continues to be so warped around what bodies are acceptable. And if we can all challenge the words that we grew up with, whether it's related to body size and shape, where it's related to constructs of masculinity, femininity, and the entire spectrum therein, then we do everybody else a service by, by again, trying to resist. And, and again, I wanna be very careful with that, that resistance is dangerous for many in their bodies. And it is why I feel like for the people for whom it's less dangerous, resisting publicly and, and and loudly as possible um starts to make it i hope less dangerous for those who can't at the moment dr g why do you think a lot of people get held back by like um not wanting to be their selves do you think it's just like a lot of shame or do you think it's just several like thousand factors of why they can't like like but feel who they truly want to be? Oh my gosh, Drew, that's such a good question. I mean, I think it probably, you know, everything to me roots in what bodies are, are thought of broadly as being acceptable, appealing, and appropriate. Mm -hmm. And American constructs of sort of acceptable, appropriate are very, very, very tangled around, you know, old puritanical notions of sort of female purity and, and um, you know, that, that women at least aren't supposed to have 
large appetites for certain things because it's unladylike. I mean, there are so many deeply entrenched visions of what certain sexes are supposed to be and not supposed to be. Um, and goodness knows, Nikki, I do not want to cisplain any of this. You know, I, I want to be really, really careful. But from my perspective as a cis woman, I certainly have felt the pressure of a ton of what women are supposed to or not supposed to be. And I know that men feel it too. And I know that people who are non-binary feel it even more as they try to create a space just for them. And then of course we have the trans community as a whole who's trying to self-define, you know, if I was assigned male at birth and I am a woman, what kind of woman do I wanna be? And then what kind of woman is society making me be? Um, I think that our parents have a huge role in messaging to us what's okay and what's not. You know, so many well-meaning parents perpetuate the ills of society upon their children in the name of, I just want my child to be safe. I don't want my child to be bullied. I want my child to be accepted. And so they themselves continue to promulgate these ideas of you've got to be this, you can't be that. But actually, as per Nikki's point about suicide rates, that only makes people less safe. The best thing we can do, those of us who are parents, is to hold space, at least in our own homes, for our children to be completely safe in their bodies, in their self-expression, in their needs, whether physical or emotional, to be able to really say, whoever you are, I love you unconditionally, period, not comma, but. Because if we can give our kids that safe space to plug in where they know they're unconditionally adored and, and encouraged to express who they are, then at least they have some inoculation against the ills of society so that when somebody acts differently, they can say at least for a moment, huh, I know that's not how my mom feels about this. Huh, that's not, that's not what my dad tells me. And they have that moment of, of safety, I think. As I raise two teenage girls, that's what I'm thinking about. Nikki, what thoughts do you have on this? I want to make sure you have a really, really clear voice on this. Oh, one of the things that I think is is troubling and I think makes standing up for other people really important is, you know, the medical community still considers being overweight uh, an illness. And you look at the, the queer community and trans community, we're no longer considered mentally ill under the DSM. Uh, the medical community is starting to see through uh, all sorts of of medical tests and studies that you know we, we were born this way this is real being trans is a real thing uh, it's not it has nothing to do with any sort of mental issue in any way and you look at the stigma that's still out there from society and i think it's going to be a long time even once the medical community starts catching up and treats um, being overweight as just another way of being and just a part of the human experience, how long is it going to take for society to accept that and change? And yeah, being gay is still an issue, you know, for so long after it's, it's no longer been deemed that by the medical community. So I think it's really important that people stand up and just start speaking out and supporting people because society has a long way to go behind the medical community, but the medical community is still often just as behind in many areas. Well, and it's appalling that the medical community would even be used as a benchmark because so often we're the agents of harm. I mean, unfortunately, that is the reality is that, you know, I, I'm proud of being a doctor. I love being a doctor. And... I myself have caused enormous harm and my profession causes terrible harm. So, you know, I say that as often as I possibly can to try to validate people's lived experience of being like, yeah, going to the doctor is incredibly traumatic for me. Or I have to brace myself, you know, I have to, I have to forgive my doctor in advance because they have power over me because they are, they're the ones who prescribe my medicine. They're the ones who prescribe my kids' medicine, whatever it may be, that I can't speak up and, and actually tell them how they harm me or they might harm me worse. 
and it's the evil I know versus the evil I don't. I mean, we cause terrible harm and whatever we can't measure, we don't believe in, which is so messed up completely unacceptable that we've somehow come from the physician's role of being the person who bears witness to our beloved patient's lived experience and who sits with them back when doctors couldn't do anything on they tried and they caused harm in those ways too but you know back when there was very little to do the role of the physician was sort of to try to to bear witness and to console and stand by and the profession has lost that so significantly as it thinks that all it is to do is to order tests and studies and to measure things and doctors aren't given enough time and haven't been encouraged enough to say oh if, if that's your lived experience it's reality you know we don't tell people who have migraines well i didn't see it on a cat scan so it's probably not real like no, 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 no it's a migraine we all know what a migraine is but there's so many more things out there that i've learned from my patients with eating disorders because I'm thinking so much about the mind-body connection. It doesn't matter if we can measure something, but what, what are we trying to make more or less real? You speak your truth. I will try to stand by and support you in it with my medical power. Um, but, it, but it does, Nikki, continue to be sort of like, oh, well, well, doctors now say this is right. So like, okay, everybody else get on board. But doctors are like so behind. Yeah, it's definitely a frustration for the trans community. I mean, there's also almost a script that we follow when we first see our therapists. We know like we have to say certain things, we have to do certain things, or we might not get the permission letters we need to start hormone treatment. And we, until we do that, then we can't go to surgery. And until we have surgery in many states, then we can't go before a judge to have our gender and name change. So there's all these steps that we have to go through that, you know, any other cis woman can go in and have the majority of the surgeries that I've had, a breast augmentation or facial surgeries. I have to have permission to do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people think that, you know, a trans person just says I'm trans and I'm a woman and that's all it is. There are so many hoops that we have to go through. We have to have so many permission letters and spend so much money to gain gain permission basically that says yeah they actually are who they say they are um, just to do that and that's not accessible for so many people and then you cap that off with so many of the doctors that you know are in therapy i'm paying 125 dollars an hour out of pocket and i have to teach my therapist what some of this is i have to research the letters that have to be written and show my therapist what needs to be what the template is and what I need to be able to go to the doctor. I have to do the same thing for my doctors to go to court. I have to explain a lot of things to my doctors at times. And that can be really difficult if you're not in a place where you feel like you can speak up because they control your future. It's hard to be an advocate for yourself a lot of times in communities where you're not really allowed to be. Well, thank you all so much for um, this incredible conversation. We have about six minutes. I'm sure you have a patient coming, Dr. G. Um, but I just wanted to give um, the last remaining minutes to whoever wants to talk about anything. <laughs> and if nobody wants to talk about anything, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have a couple things I guess I could say. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that we don't often think about in issues of either, you know, struggling with, with eating disorders or being overweight or whatever it might be is what often is going into that, what the trauma is that, that causes some of that, what someone's experience is and why someone might use an eating disorder. You know, in the trans community for trans youth, if someone's trans masculine and they're about to start puberty and they realize that by being underweight, that's going to prevent some of the effects of puberty and their parents or society won't let them transition, they might choose having an eating disorder and 
you know, binging or purging, have anorexia in order to not fully go through pu puberty. Uh, for someone like me who is 6'3 and looks like a football linebacker, I might use or choose to have an eating disorder to lose bulk because I feel that that is safer for me to deal with that because I think, oh, I can possibly control that. I can stop later on, but I can't stop that person from attacking me because I stand out. I can't stop that person from misgendering me every single time I leave my house. I can't stop people from staring at me, but I can figure out a way to control my eating. And if I just get a little bit smaller, if I just get thinner, if I just look more feminine, feminine, lose the broad shoulders and more of the muscles, then maybe someday people will accept me for who I am. And we don't think about that a lot of times. We just look at someone is too thin, someone is too, too big. And we don't often look at the reasons why people are often choosing that. Sometimes it's society, a lot of times it's societal pressures in many different ways, but there's often a lot of issues of safety. There's so many things in there. I mean, I, for a long time, took more, um, higher dosage of my hormones than the doctors really wanted me to because I wanted to see quicker effects on my face. Because the more feminine I look, the safer I am. And I see that every day in how I'm treated. If I don't go out with makeup, I get misgendered, I get more stares, I get more comments than if I do put on makeup, dress nicer. And so there's real physical safety in manipulating my body in ways that can be really harmful. Society pushes trans women or trans men into surgeries. And a lot of times that's necessary to legally transition those surgeries are expensive. They come with a lot of complications. I had double the amount of surgeries I planned on because I had so many complications and it's cost me a lot, especially in my climbing career. I haven't been able to really climb well or much at all in the past four years because of that. But that's the only way I can safely be me. And to some extent, it's the only way that companies are actually supportive of me because now I look a certain way, I'm presentable, um, I have pretty privilege, I have a lot of things that make me acceptable to be a spokesperson for the trans community in the outdoors or beyond. So what happens to the people who can't afford that or can't fit into that? That's such a vital point to bring up in caring for trans patients in my practice and you know, when I teach other eating disorder professionals about intersectionality and, and eating disorders, I always present a study that shows that in a group of about 450 trans adults who were interviewed about their eating disorder history, they had far higher eating disorder histories than cis women who are usually considered the benchmark for having the highest level of eating disorder behaviors. And in fact, it's the gender non-binary individuals who have the highest of all eating disorder uh, pathology, typically. And you're absolutely right. You know, for us to come, for me to come from a health privileged place where I don't have an eating disorder history as a provider, in addition to all of the other, and, and imply to somebody, well, we just got to fix this eating disorder problem you have. I've, I've already failed the patient because I haven't asked what role is this playing for you? So, you know, for my patients who are trans men who, for whom having an eating disorder prevented their period, there are a lot of different ways that a physician can show up and give an alternative solution that doesn't involve harming oneself through disordered eating. And I think the best way providers can show up for our patients is to listen more to ask, what does this mean to you? What is this doing for you? And then think really creatively, how can I use my medical power to help you solve that problem in a way that still allows you to honor your body with nutrition and rest? 
Yeah, there's an author, Roxane Gay, who has a book called Hunger that I think is amazing and so insightful into ways that a, a cis woman has used an eating disorder to try to protect herself. And it's it's so such a beautiful, heartbreaking book. She's amazing. She is. I've been meaning to read that one. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> it's really good. She also narrates it in her audio book and it's really good hearing her um, read it as well. Um, wow, this has just been an incredible conversation. I wish we could keep going for like two hours. <laughs> um, and thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. G. Thank you all so much. I'm so incredibly grateful for the work all three of you are doing. Let's keep it going. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Take care, friends. Cool. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thanks all for being here. That was like really wonderful. I really, really just learned so much and yeah, just appreciate you all your bravery and talking about stuff that's hard to talk about. Uh, thanks for starting, starting your part of the conversation. And yeah, thanks Drew. Like, it's yeah. been awesome seeing what you're doing and. Yeah, I've learned that vulnerability is power. So it's like, it's hard to take those first steps of being yourself, but like it's paying off by just showing others that they can love themselves. Yeah. Uh, in whatever state they're in, you know? Yeah. I'm sure you get so many amazing messages in your DMs from people who see themselves oh, it's, through you. It's been, it's, it's been wild for sure. Um, I think things are changing um, slowly. Yeah. I've talked to industry folks and stuff. And, um, it, a lot of this time, it takes like two to three years to get gear developed. So it's like they're starting now in hopes of, hitting that demographic two or three years from now. Yeah. That kind of stuff. So it's been good. Good conversations have been had. That's great. Yeah. Thanks and for putting yourself out there to do that. Yeah, for sure. I think, and thank you for putting yourself out there, Nikki. I've learned so much just from your, from your posts and your work. And it helps me because I mean, I'm stuck here in Tennessee and we don't have a lot of that stuff here in the South as far as advocacy and, um and so i've i've learned a, i've learned a lot for for sure from um and i work in mental health too so it's also beneficial because we see it we see it a lot now um yeah like you said like the suicide rate is going up and stuff and a lot of people are struggling and a lot of those are are trans individuals so it's like it's it's good to learn you know yeah well, thanks for being open to learning and thank you for oh, the education yeah. you've you've given me a lot too and yeah awesome well i'm just uh really i have to say i i think i grew up with a pretty narrow definition of what beauty is supposed to be for a woman like what dr g was saying um and i i find it a huge relief to see other bodies in sports um and it's been interesting for me to watch my reactions to seeing other bodies in sports because <clears throat> I almost feel like I limited my sense of beauty <laughs> because of like what I was taught and, you know, the, the parental everything. But in reality, when I see like a bigger body, I, I think it's beautiful. Like I have moments where I'm like, I'm looking at those people like, wow, you know, and like just admiring. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, it's been interesting for me to think like my idea of beauty is really limited and um, not that beauty is like the most important thing at all, but um, I love seeing all kinds of bodies and I, I find it such a, a relief. And I also find myself, it opens something in me you know, where I feel like, oh, wow, yeah, like, I think that's beautiful. I think it shows people you're not alone, you know, it's yeah. like, if you're, if you're wanting to get into this whole climbing world or whatever, uh, outdoor world, like, you want to see people that look like you, um, 
And so, because it'll make you, you know, make you keep coming back. You know, you know, you won't feel isolated just being the one. Um, I've, I have a great community now of um, strong climbers and climbers like me, and so it's been it's been great to find that, and I hope people get to find it too. Um, that they start seeing it more and the more it's been being seen, the more people will start showing up, you know, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sure there are plenty of other documentaries and books on this, this topic, but for the trans community, there's a documentary called disclosure that's focused on media portrayal of trans people over the years and watching that you really get to see how public perception has been shaped by by what you've seen for the last 30, 40 years or longer. And mm -hmm. I know that's been the same thing with, you know, you, you mentioned that's your idea of beauty. Well, it is to an extent, but that's what society has taught you to believe in that. And we all have that with so many different parts of our lives. And the more we start looking at what our society says things should be and what is really right or what's really going on and questioning that, I think that's where a lot of the change is starting to really happen is when we question what we've been taught our entire lives, whether it's been conscious or subconsciously through what we see. Yeah, I think like when Dr. G was talking about, we start, we're talking about our parents kind of teaching us this stuff or like this generational stuff. Like a lot of time we start thinking for ourselves when we get outside of those things, we start, we go to college and we start like thinking about like, different ideas about stuff and I went to social work school so it was like very open and like that was like a safe space um and that's where I kind of learned to be myself you know um so I think yeah it's having those feeling safe at your house and stuff is important and I think that was a good point that Dr. Ju brought up was um the when you start thinking for yourself as versus what you've been told your whole life definitely that's awesome. I'm starting my master's in social work this fall. Oh, nice. Yeah. I have a bachelor's. I didn't want to go for a master's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a full-time social worker. So I'm a weekend, weekend warrior. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks that was awesome. Yeah. Drew works with um, prison people coming out of prison. Yeah. Right? People coming out of jail and prison. Um, so kind of re-entry stuff. So I'm yeah. a criminal justice case manager, but really it's just case management for individuals who have a criminal record oh, that's really cool yeah i've been at, i've been in mental health for like nine years now so oh. in some form or fashion took a little break because it got to me yeah but i'm sure i are definitely worried about that for myself or well yeah i worked in a psych hospital and that kind of broke me so yeah well, <laughs> like a year and a half in the psych hospital was like so there i've seen a lot so it's just, you know but I'm in a position now where I feel good and I'm able to go climb and stuff. And that's nice. awesome. And I thought, I thought you were in social work or trying to get into it or something. So. Yeah. Cool. My, my undergrad isn't in that at all. It's in commercial recreation, but ah, yeah, with everything cool. I'm doing now, social work just seemed like the right area to. Yeah. You can, and, you can change some lives for sure. Um, yeah. It's good stuff. It's hard, but yeah can handle it yeah oh man y'all are the best i really enjoy this conversation huh. well thanks for having us yeah thanks for inviting me Carol. yeah um i think it's really important and i know that um i know there's a lot to learn i'm excited to watch disclosure and to read hunger i wrote my notes <laughs> nice. I, I wrote down that those two and I, I, you know, I think that it's like really exciting, just like what you said, Nikki, um, about, you know, all these really homophobic, like root names and all this stuff. I mean, for so long, I think I was like, how are people getting away with talking about this in this way? How do people get away with talking about people who are bigger than them in, a, in this, um, like a, you know, dismissing them in terms of their value as a person? Um, and it's the reason why people get away with it is because if people don't speak up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I would like to speak up. So I, I'm gonna work on that. Nice. 
Thank you.